Lovely. Okay, let's try this again. Oh. Well, we will just do this the old fashioned way and we will just record it and I'll upload it to YouTube later. So if we are ready, um, I'd like to say good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Watershed Wednesday webinars. My name is Jennifer Harville, and I'm a natural resources specialist with the Tug Hill Commission in Watertown, Watertown New York. So welcome to you all, especially if this is your first time attending the Black River Watershed Conference. We're really looking forward to the day when we can hold this conference in person again, but enough about that. A couple of things before we get started. First, you're all muted, but please use the chat to ask questions. And second, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel and on our website. Uh, the links to our training page and our YouTube page will be provided in the follow-up emails from me sent by Zoom. So please hang on to those emails for your reference and I'll have the recordings and presentations uploaded as soon as possible. Your friends and colleagues at the Tug Hill Commission, the Lewis, Hamilton, Herkimer, Jefferson, and Oneida County Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and the New York State DEC Region 6 have been hard at work putting together this series for you, and we hope you'll find it informative and interesting. Today's presentation explores how climate change is impacting our forested ecosystems, how an emerging pest is threatening hemlock trees, and the implications of both, both on our watersheds. So joining me today is my co-coordinator in this webinar series, Nichelle Swisher, and she's the district manager from the Lewis County Soil and Water Conservation District. Thank you, Jen, um, co-conspirator, I like to say. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, this second, like Jen said, a second webinar in this series actually brings two topics together that are related globally, regionally, and locally. The topic of climate change and its impacts on forested watersheds and ecosystems is presented to you today by Dr. Lindsay Rustad, a research ecologist at the USDA Forest Service Center for the research on for research on ecosystem change in Durham, New Hampshire. Dr. Rustad has studied climate change and its impact on the northern forest for three decades. She'll share her perspective on what we know about climate change at a global scale, what's happening here in the northeast, and how this impacts our northern forest. Her presentation today is based on a paper that she co-authored titled Changing Climate, Changing Forests, the Impacts of Climate Change on Forests of the Northeastern United States and Eastern Canada. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rustad uh, to begin their presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna go through that first awkward state of sharing uh, my screen. Um, so is uh, it up on the screen? Great, great. So thank you for that um, introduction. Um, again, I'm Lindsay Rustad and I am a research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service. And I have spent uh, the better part of the last three decades trying to figure out what makes forests uh, tick and particularly how large scale disturbances like air pollution, climate change and extreme weather events are impacting um, our forests. I'm also a co-director of the USDA uh, Northeast Climate Hub. I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later in my talk. So uh, speaking of my talk, uh, anybody, uh, well, let me see if I can put this in full screen mode. That's, that might be a little better. So anybody that knows me, um, I like to do things a little bit differently. Um, so I'm going to present my talk as an infographic. And this is an infographic that I co-created with my daughter, Mary uh, Zambello, who very conveniently is a graphic uh, designer. And I'm going to present it using Prezi. Good thing about using Prezi is it might be a little bit different than PowerPoint. Uh, the bad thing is it's a new technology and I might crash and burn and I'll have to go to a, a backup. So uh, let's see how it goes. So anyway, in, in this talk, I'm going to really give you three short stories. 
And uh, the first one is a short story down here. And here we go over the last 800,000 years of climate change at a global scale and the rise in our understanding of this phenomena. Uh, the second is an even shorter story, which is the last 65 years of a changing climate at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which is right here in our backyard in New Hampshire, just one state over from you guys, and the rise in our understanding of uh, this impact in our backyard. And then the third story goes over the impact of a changing climate on the forest that we all uh, love of the forests of Northern New England. So with no further ado, this first graph shows um, atmospheric CO2, that is carbon dioxide concentrations in parts per million on the Y axis and time with a little poetic license on the X axis. And if we zoom in, over the last 800,000 years, we know for a fact, and that is from the chemical analysis of air bubbles trapped in ice cores extracted from the Antarctic ice sheet, we know that atmospheric CO2 has bounced around a lot over the last 800,000 years. But we also know that the mean during this time has been about 275 parts per million, and it rarely got above 300 parts per million until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution where the inputs of, um, of greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels um, and major changes in land use um, started putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. And we know for a fact that atmospheric CO2 was at 315 parts per million in 1958. And we know that because Sir Charles Keeling, then a young man, started measuring atmospheric CO2 on the top of Mauna Loa, in Hawaii. And what began as a very obscure and underfunded undertaking has since grown to be um, one of the most important long term ecological records um, in the history of our planet. Let me just move my picture over there. So, in the ensuing uh, six decades since he started measuring, um, by his measurements and measurements from stations all around the world, we know that there has been a steady, uh, significant increase in CO2 concentrations to the point that they were at 419 parts per million when I checked CO2 now uh, just an hour ago. So CO2 concentrations have gone up by 33% since uh, the mid-century and over 40% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We also know, of course, that they're going to continue to increase. These dotted lines show um, expected CO2 concentrations for various emission scenarios based on very sophisticated, what we call coupled ocean atmosphere models. And under our very uh, most aggressive emission reduction scenarios, we might expect CO2 to stabilize at about where we are right now. But under business as usual, we expect CO2 to perhaps double again by the end um, of this century. And again, just to point out, these are all to scale. Um, this is where we were for 800,000 years. This is where we are now. And these are where we might be going by the end of uh, this century. As goes CO2 um, and actually other, um, uh, what we now call heat trapping gases, so goes temperature. And I've now superimposed temperature um, on my CO2 graph. And if we zoom in for the past 800,000 years, we can see that um, temperature tracked CO2 fairly closely. And we know this from things like pollen um, and sediment cores and all kinds of other what we call proxies to temperature. And so we know that CO that temperature um, began to rise um, in the 1800s along uh, with CO2. Um, I'm a scientist, so I like actual numbers. And so these bars here represent the actual um, means from the instruments. And I started in 1950, the record actually goes back even further. And this is a graph that's called a temperature anomaly. You may have seen some of these. And basically, um, each one of these bars represents the annual mean for that year, but superimposed on the zero line, which is just the mean for a longer period of time. It happens to be 1985 to 2000 for this. But really, the take home on this is if you go back in time, uh, the colors are cool and below the bar. And of course, they're rising to warmer colors above the bore. And we know for a fact that surface temperature is warmed by 
one degree C, almost two degrees Fahrenheit over this time. And if you think that you're always hearing headlines, you know, it's the warmest month on record, it's the warmest year on record, it really has been with the last five years being the warmest five years on the instrument record. If we follow these CO2 emission lines out, we have these bars here, which represent the temperature that we would expect under those emission scenarios. And you can see under the most aggressive reduction, we're still going to see a 1.6 degree C, almost three degree Fahrenheit um, increase in mean global temperature. And under that business as usual scenario, we might see up to four uh, degrees C, eight degrees Fahrenheit increase. Um, in temperature. Now, CO2 and temperature have been at these levels before, right? Make no mistake about it. But remember, dinosaurs were roaming the, the world during that time. We had no polar ice caps, and the sea level was dozens, if not hundreds of feet higher than it, than it is right now. Um, before I leave temperature, I want to um, talk about these two bars here. We can zoom in on them. Uh, the upper bar is two degrees C, and that's the target kind of cap in temperature from the Paris Accord. And the lower one, 1.5 degrees C, is the suggested cap from other scientific organizations. And the idea of these caps is that if we go over this, we're going to go past tipping points where physical and social changes are basically irreversible in, in our lifetime. So physical changes, um, think of the collapse of the, the ice sheets, think of extinction, um, think of the slowing of the ocean currents for social changes, uh, think of widespread famine and drought um, and climate migration. So we really want to try and keep um, the temperatures below these caps and it really is quite, quite urgent. So, so with that, speaking of urgent and, and critical, um, I spent a lot of my time thinking about extreme weather events. And since I started studying climate change back in the early 1990s, we've always been saying that, oh, we expect to see an increase in the frequency and, and severity of extreme weather events. And that's basically just physics. You put more energy into the atmosphere, you're gonna supercharge the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, um, and like a pot on a stove boiling, you're gonna have these extreme excursions in weather. Um, so that could be heat waves, droughts, um, hurricanes, windstorms, all kinds of things. From a forest perspective, um, there's two points I wanna make. Um, one, um, that, that forests may be more susceptible uh, to these extreme weather events than they are to kind of the slow gradual change in temperature um, and in precipitation and in CO2. They might cause our own tipping points in our forests. And the second one, which is really frustrating, is, is we as ecologists, we can't just extrapolate what we know from extreme events in the past to what might happen in extreme events in the future because the underlying template of climate and hydrology and air pollution and land use is all uh, changing. And I wanna give you just two examples of what I mean by that. And so here we are in New England um, and we're all familiar with winter rain on snow events. So if we go back, you know, 60 plus years, 1958, when Sir Charles Keeling was on top of Mauna Loa, uh, we know we had very thick snowpacks and we would get those winter rains that would soak into the snowpack and be released gradually over time, right? Fast forward uh, to about now, we have much patchier snowpacks. We have a lot of exposed ground. That same winter rain comes and flows into the streams and goes crashing uh, down, moving boulders and changing stream channels and been quite a catastrophic event. However, you fast forward another 60 years, the soils might not be frozen at all. And that same winter rain event might just percolate gently through the soils. So same exact event, but very, very different outcomes. Another example is late spring frosts, right? So we're all in spring, the, the leaves are coming out, um, but we sometimes get these excursions of cold, uh, cold weather coming down. So if we go back to 1958, in most of the areas that, that we walk in, you know, the buds were still tightly closed and those buds are very resistant to frost, of course. Fast forward to now, and in most of our area, you know, a third to 50% of the leaves are unfurled, and these new leaves are very sensitive to frost. So you get that same late spring frost, and you can lose part of your canopy. Fast forward another 60 years, all the leaves are probably going to be out. Um, and again, a late spring frost could mean you could totally lose your canopy. So a very catastrophic effect. 
So same event, very different outcome. So I just want to talk um, briefly, um, just mention lip service. I don't have time to talk about other vectors of change. We've talked about um, heat trapping gases and temperature and extreme events. We all know that we expect to see changes in precipitation in the quantity, uh, the distribution, the timing, the intensity, the, the phase. Um, with increasing temperature, we expect to see a decline in land and sea ice decline in land and sea ice, we expect to see a rise in sea levels exacerbated by the thermal expansion of water. And as you increase CO2 in the atmosphere, it dissolves into the oceans into a weak carbonic acid. And we know we're gonna have ocean acidification. You know, so again, we, we could talk uh, many hours on that. But um, I'm not going to do that. I want to end this section on the global perspective, talking about just the tremendous increase in knowledge, which really I have witnessed over the course of my career. And this is kind of exemplified by the IPCC assessment reports. And if you're not familiar with IPCC, it stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it was established by the United Nations in 1988 to synthesize the accumulating uh, knowledge on climate change and make it available to the broader public and particularly to policymakers. First report came out in 1990. There have been four more reports since then, some special reports, and we are all kind of anxiously awaiting for the next report in, in 2022. Uh, the reason I just pointed out is just to say that there are thousands of scientists from all countries around the world who are working together on this problem. Virtually, they all agree that the climate is changing quite rapidly and that there's a human fingerprint on that change. And I like to think that if we caused it, uh, we can uh, change it. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So I now want to go to the local level. So this is my second story. Uh, this is the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. We're over here in the, um, the heart of the White Mountains, just one state over from you. Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest um, is one of 81 experimental forests run by the, the US Forest Service across the continental uh, US, Alaska, Hawaii, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, we were established in 1955 as a center for water research for the region, and we have since grown to be one of the longest continuously running and comprehensive ecosystem study sites in the world, although I'm a little bit biased. so. Um, down here is a picture I'm taking from one of our webcams from yesterday. You can see we're just beginning to uh, green up. Um, here is one of our charismatic inhabitants, the black-throated blue warbler. And up here is just some of the research highlights. You might know us from some of the studies on the impacts of forest harvest, on water cycling and nutrient cycling. Those of you who remember that the days of acid rain, acid rain was discovered at Hubbard Brook. Uh, we have some of the longest migratory and resident bird study uh, studies in the world. And because we've been around for 65 years, we had this unique opportunity to look at the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events on our forests. And one thing that is unique about Hubbard Brook is we don't just have one uh, indicator of climate change. We have many meteorological, soil, biological, hydrological, and they're basically all telling us the same thing about our climate. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of these, the ones uh, in red right there. So of course we all think about air temperature. This is just a graph of air temperature at a high and low elevation station, just to show, of course, we are seeing an increase in temperature, about 1.5 degrees C, almost three degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, it is not even across uh, the year. This messy graph here just shows the mean temperature, max and minimum for our four seasons, just to show that our winters have been warming the most. And then within our winters, it's the minimum temperature or the nighttime temperature that's warming the nose. So if you've been around for a while and you say, gee, I just don't remember, you know, or I don't see these, you know, deeply cold days that I do remember, um, we can show that they, they just are not um, typically occurring. Uh, water balance, um, this top line just shows precipitation has been going up. As precipitation goes up, stream flow goes up. Um, and in our case, we actually have evaporation is going down and we're kind of trying to understand what's going on with that, if it's clouds um, or, or what else is causing that, that decline. 
Um, in terms of precipitation, we've seen a whopping 12 inch increase in precipitation from the beginning of our record to the last couple of years. These bars just kind of been that increase by decade. And then the different colors or shades here um, show kind of the different type of events. And I just want to point out that most of our increase in precipitation is coming from these red middle bars, which represent one to two inch rainstorms. So it's not the huge ones. It's not lots of little ones. It's those kind of heavy drenching rains. And then they're separated by longer periods of, of drought. Uh, very clear signal. Um, New England, we all love snow. Uh, we also know that snow is going down and basically all metrics of snow, whether it's maximum snow depth or the amount of water that's retained in the snowpack or the number of days with snow have all been going down um, with number of days have gone down by almost three weeks over the period um, of record. And finally, the last one is, is ice cover. And if you like ice fishing um, or being out on the ice, uh, we all know that the ice is going in later it's coming out earlier. And overall, we've had um, almost again, a three week um, re reduction in the, the days of ice uh, cover. So uh, lots going on. And again, I could spend another hour talking about the really cool extreme uh, weather experiments that we've been doing, but I'm gonna kind of fast forward and go up here, talk about climate change and uh, forests. So in, in the mid 2000s, I think it was the, the fourth assessment report was just coming out. We realized that we had a ton of information on climate change and impacts on forests. So I got together with my 50 best friends and colleagues from the Northeastern US and Eastern Canada. And we put together what we knew about a changing climate changing forest um, in terms of the biological changes, the hydrological changes and the biogeochemical changes. And uh, we wrote five papers, uh, one on climate and hydrology, one on forests, one on wildlife, one on pest pathogens and invasives, um, and one on uh, biogeochemistry and synthesized this in this publication. And I'm happy to put the, the link to this publication in the, the, the website. So kind of bringing together you know, what we know about changing climate, um, changing forests. And I'm just going to touch briefly on, on two of these, but feel free to uh, look up more on that. Just very briefly, um, our region included the five New England states, New York, and the Eastern Canadian provinces, because climate change doesn't know anything about political borders, right? Um, the amount of information we had available was basically inversely proportional uh, to, to the geographies, geography. So a lot of our data came from New York and the, the New England states. Um, we took an approach of starting with first principles. We had 50 scientists in the room. So what did they think, you know, based on the laws of thermodynamics and ecological principles that we thought would happen under a changing climate? And then we peered into the past um, to see what changes we had actually seen. And then we deployed our best models um, to do future predictions. And these models are always, always being Im improved. So... Um, when we think of climate, um, just to set the stage um, over this entire region, we saw very similar to Hubbard Brook, you know, a couple degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, winter's warming most, about 9% increase in precip, more intense precip, longer growing seasons, less snow and ice. Um, and then when we did our modeling for the future, um, again, under low to high emission scenarios, we expect to see significant warming over the the next uh, number of decades, summer is warming most instead of winters, seven to 14% increase in precip, more intense precip, longer growing seasons, um, a decrease or maybe elimination of snowpack, except for places like the Adirondacks or the Western mountains of Maine and more extreme, um, I like sometimes call it wacky uh, weather. Um, this is a graph you may all have seen. It was put together by the Union of Concerned Scientists, and it was actually put together back in 2007, so I kind of date myself, um, but I, I really like this. It shows for all the states, you can pick New York like I did here, kind of what the mean climate was, 1960, 1990, and then kind of as it marches down under warming. So the yellow or the light color here a low emission scenario, the red is the high emission scenario. And it just suggests, and this holds for today too, that under a low emission, the climate of New York might look more like that of Virginia at the end of this century. And under a high emission scenario, the climate of New York might look more like 
uh, North Carolina or South Carolina. So it just kind of grounds us in, in what we think uh, might happen. So in terms of forests, um, we know for a fact, right? It's no mystery that forest composition shifts in response to slowly changing climate. It's done that since the ice ages. There's no mystery here. We also know that we expect suitable climate um, for different species to move up in elevation and north in climate, excuse me, north in, in latitude. Um, but we also know that species have trouble keeping up with the pace of current climate change uh, relative to their slower reproduction, um, dispersal, or general um, mechanisms of migration. So we have looked and continue to look for, you know, in the past for changes in composition, you know, across the ecotones going uh, north south or up and down in elevation. But it has been really, really hard to see any of these. And that's just because there's so many other things that are happening at the same time, you know, changes in pollution dynamics, insects, pests, and pathogens, land use. It's really hard to see, but uh, we, we continue to uh, look for it. Um, in terms of forest productivity, um, again, first principles, we would expect um, productivity to increase due to warmer temperatures, longer growing seasons. CO2, atmospheric CO2 is actually a fertilizer for trees. Um, and we still have a lot of nitrogen deposition hanging around despite our reductions due to the Clean Air Act and its amendments. Um, so we might see an increase in productivity, but we also have these other factors where we might see a decrease in productivity due to you know, this increase in winter freeze thaw, droughts, fires, air pollution, forest pests and pathogens. So it's really hard um, to kind of figure out which way these things are going to go. Um, if we look to the past, um, we can see tree declines that were associated with different climate events. Just a table we put together and to simplify it for you, um, just in a nutshell, um, we found ex, uh, cases where birch, sugar maple, and red spruce showed decline after freeze thaw events or late freeze, and species like oak, um, oak and ash showed periods of decline um, after drought. So we know there's a link, right, between extreme events and climate and, and forest productivity. If we look to the future, we and um, many people have used what we call a bioclimatic envelope approach. Um, it's um, actually pretty simple. Um, it was pioneered by Lewis Iverson of the Forest Service. And he has, I'm going to show you in a minute, just a tremendous website uh, where you can look up your favorite species or your favorite backyard. But basically, it does two things. One, it takes develops a statistical relationship between tree species and where they are right now based on hundreds of species and hundreds of variables. Two, it determines future climate with the very best of the climate models uh, using different models and different emission scenarios. And then three, it projects future suitable habitat um, based on the existing statistical relationships and those new projections. That's actually a pretty um, simple idea. And I really encourage you to go to the uh, Climate Change Atlas and you can see model potential suitable habitat for 125 species. Um, and if you like birds, we now have one for 147 bird species. So it's um, a pretty, pretty neat tool uh, that we have. The take home on this, if you look across our region on individual species is we're gonna have winners and losers, right? Expected losers are some of our iconic species like spruce and fir and sugar maple, white birch, northern white cedar. But we're going to have winners like some of the oak, some of the pines, some of the, the hickories. So it's going to be um, a balance. Again, if you want to see what's going on in New York, you can go to that website. I just pulled up um, sorted um, by, by decreases. Here's some of the common names. And you can just see what species you might expect for New York to decrease, what species you might expect to, to increase. Again, winners and losers. Um, and the final thing here is to talk about kind of forest type as a whole. These are three maps. Uh, the one on the left is kind of the current, relatively current distribution of species. And then what we might expect suitable habitat 
under a low emission or a high emission scenario by the end of the century. So here, and again, I apologize if it's hard to see color, um, but up here we have spruce fir in blue, we have beech birch maple in magenta and some of the uh, southern species in green. You know, under a low emission, we would expect suitable habitat for spruce and fir to decline beech birch maple to expand and some of these southern species to um, expand. And under a high emission scenario, we'd expect an elimination of the suitable habitat for spruce and fir and maybe even beech birch maple. I put that in, in air quotes um, because this is not exactly what we expect the forest to look like by the end of the century, because we all know that forests have long lifespans and they're not gonna pick themselves up by the roots, right? And march north. But what it does mean that they will be growing in suboptimal climates for them. So they might be more uh, susceptible to other stressors like insects, pests, and, and pathogens. So um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up here some closing statements on just some of the climate science. Uh, we know without a doubt the climate has changed rapidly um, and will continue to change rapidly into the future as in the next decades, um, century. Uh, we know for a fact that forests of the Northeast are expected to respond slowly right, to this changing climate. They're hard to uh, keep pace with it. But we know that extreme weather and interactions with multiple stressors, we'll hear about one of those in a little bit, um, are going to impact forests in really unexpected ways. And finally, um, we have to live with the fact and maybe be happy right, of the fact um, that they're going to be winners and losers. So I always get asked, you know, well, what can we do? What can we do? Um, and we always hear the words adaptation and mitigation. And we're going to hear a lot more about this under the current administration. And at a 50,000 foot level, um, we can adapt to a changing climate by preserving or increasing our protected areas, our forest areas, maintaining, preserving, maybe even increasing um, diversity of species because we don't really know who the winners and losers are going to be. Uh, we can try to reduce other stressors like air pollution or introduce pests and pathogens. And we're really learning um, a lot on topics like adaptive silviculture and um, wildlife management. Mitigation is a hot topic. Uh, right now, and I'm pretty excited about this. And we're really hearing about this natural carbon solutions. And this is a paper that came out in 2018 that talks about the 20 largest um, natural carbon solutions. And just forests are right up there. You know, keeping forests as forests, um, planting, uh, planting trees, or keeping carbon in soil or um, protecting our, our soil quality. So again, fascinating list um, just gives us a lot to work on. And of course, um, replacing fossil fuels with, with renewables. And I like to think of the law of the humongous. You know, if we're seven plus billion people on the planet, right? If everybody does a little change, a light bulb, a car, drive less, whatever it is, we're all doing that because of COVID anyway, um, it multiplies out to be a humongous effect. So what we do counts. And then my very last thing is the climate hubs. You know, if you have not heard of the climate hubs, they were established in 2014, actually under Obama, um, and they were established to um, be a source of um, climate information. Uh, the mission is to develop and deliver science-based region-specific information technologies to farmers and foresters um, of the region. So if you need help, um, help is at hand. Um, it's very region-specific. There are 10 climate hubs. And of course, we are up here um, part of the Northeast Hub. And if you want to hear more of it, visit our website or let me know. I'm a co-director of the Hub. Be happy to uh, connect you with some of our information or some of our tools. So that um, is what I've got in my, my infographic. Um, I'm super excited um, about the next talk, which is really going to dig into um, a case study about some of the impacts. And, um, that's what I got for today. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, we do have one question um, that involves, uh, let's see, my chat page just moved. It says, um, are you involved in research that explores how forests function to remove CO2 as part of the solution? Um, well, as a biogeochemist, just about everything we do is about carbon, nitrogen, and the other elements. So we've been studying carbon cycling for 
a long time. My research is a lot focused on um, how extreme weather events or climate change um, can reduce the productivity of forests. I have a big ice storm experiment, you know, as an example. So it's going to have a major short-term impact on carbon, you know, where it is in the forest, um, and we're following recovery over time. So I think there's a, a just a, a huge pending explosion, you know, of, of research really synthesizing what we know um, and starting new research on how carbon is stored in the forest, um, perhaps how we can pack more carbon into the forest or keep the carbon that we have um, in there and protect it over time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we had any other questions, um, certainly uh, put them in the chat. Um, at this point, uh, we will move on to our second presenter, which kind of gets us down to, um, you know, kind of the impacts uh, for, you know, more specifically of climate change. We have uh, Carolyn Carey Marshner joins us from the New York State Hemlock Initiative at Cornell University. Carey's background is in, <clears throat> excuse me, general ecology with experience in forest, prairie, riparian, and the cool stream ecosystems. Carrie has been with the Cornell University's New York State Hemlock Initiative since 2015, where she coordinates uh, the initiative's outreach efforts and works with partners to facilitate conservation planning. And at this point, you can take it over, Carrie. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for an awesome talk. That was really informative. I appreciate it. So, um, New York State Hemlock Initiative always works with our awesome partners around the region, including your guys' very own St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Invasive Species Management Region, um, Salilo Prism. And a lot of our funding is from the New York State DEC and also from the Forest Service, USDA APHIS, and the EPA. So um, I'm going to breeze through what hemlock trees look like in the hopes that you guys know what they look like. But just in case you don't, I'm not going to. You're just, you're just gonna have to learn to identify them yourselves. Um, hemlocks are really important for our forests because they, they're they what we call a foundation species. You may have heard of keystone species, the big top predators that hold the ecosystem together by driving um, ecosystem processes down below them. A foundation species is a very abundant, um, a very abundant species that is essentially like the, the ground upon which the ecosystem is built. And the hemlocks are like that. They where they they are very abundant. They form these beautiful deep dark groves that create a very different habitat from the hardwood forests that surround them. And they are our only evergreen that is really adapted to deep shade. Um, they're especially adapted so that their needles can take just a tiny little light flex from filtering in from the forest canopy and still photosynthesize. So you'll see them holding foliage lower down into the canopy than other species do. And they're, they're our only conifer that grows in our gorges in the Finger Lakes region and in ravines up in your guys' region and on the northern slopes. They support over 400 species. Uh, many of them are also exist in the surrounding hardwood forest, but they either they exist in different, different associations with each other, or they come into the hemlock groves for protection or shelter. Um, the hemlocks, the temperatures in a hemlock grove are about 10 degrees C cooler than the air above them in the summertime. And they're warmer and less windy in the winter because they have that evergreen foliage that's blocking some of the wind. And so in the summertime, animals seek out the refuge of the hemlocks from the heat. And then in the winter, they're seeking refuge from harsh winter conditions. I actually found out recently that um, some people call them the ever feeding tree for the deer because they have these loose floppy branches. And as the snowpack, gets deeper in the wintertime, it traps more and more of the hemlock branches and pulls them down where the animals can reach them to feed on them. Hemlocks are also really important for our aquatic ecosystems. They help keep our freshwater streams 
cool, which is really important in our area because we're kind of teetering right on the edge of being too warm in our many of our streams for our much loved cold water fish like trout who people love to fish for. And um, they also help stabilize the stream flows into the streams because they're, they're doing a lot of their respiration at a different time of year than the hardwoods. So they're most active in the spring and in the fall. And so they're pulling up water from the ground right when we have a, an overabundance of water. And then they're less active in the summertime when we're in drought conditions. One of our Cornell graduate students recently published a uh, modeling paper where he looked at 81 watersheds in the Eastern region that have hemlock with or without hemlock woolly adelgid. And he found that the stream flows were more stable and less flashy, meaning big spikes with rain events and then really low during, during droughty periods without HWA. So if you want stable stream flows and stable water supplies, it's nice to have your hemlocks stay in the watershed. They also create a unique habitat. Um, hemlocks needles are really slow to break down. And so they create this thick, deep duff that can be hundreds of years old. And, um, and that, that's a habitat for the terrestrial system, but it also creates a unique water chemistry going into the aquatic systems. Um, hemlock are also called, uh, sorry, brook trout are also called hemlock trout because they can be much more abundant in watersheds that have hemlock. In the Delaware Water Gap, somebody did a study in the early 2000s and found up to three times more brook trout in the watersheds with hemlock. Why, is, why are we talking about this here? It's because of over three quarters of New York's forests are privately held. And so the decisions that individual landowners make on their land are critical to the health of New York's larger forest systems. And hemlock are the third most common tree in New York. We have more hemlocks than any other of the lower 48 states. And if you look at this map, um, can you guys see my cursor? I'm looking at Lindsay to see if she nods or not. Yes. Yes. Thank you. If you guys look up here, you guys have a ton of hemlock. You have um, the, the two big hotspots are the Southern Adirondacks and the Southern Tug Hill and to a lesser extent, the Catskills. And what we don't want is for our forest to look like this. This is Pisgah National Forest um, after Hemlock Willi Adelgid, which is what I'm here to talk about, moved through. And um, they did not have as many hemlock as you guys do. So this is what our pest looks like. I'm not going to um, Let me set the stage here. These are all the different places where hemlocks are uh, native in the world. And you can see that we have about eight different species. Um, of those, all of the other ones except for us have a native adelgid pest. Um, we, are, we are the unlucky ones who didn't have one. And so when HWA arrived, here, our trees were not adapted to a piercing, sucking pest like this one is. Um, this is where HWA is in the state. It started down in the city in the 80s and moved its way north and then farther north and west. Um, and these are actually outliers because they were started by, they were independently infested by uh, landscape trees which were purchased from the Mid-Atlantic. And this is not quite up to date. There's another one right up in here that was just discovered about two months ago. So this pest, what is it? If you look at this photo, hemlock woolly adelgid looks like this. Uh, this white woolly bundle, all these little bundles on the twigs, those are hemlock woolly adelgid. There are little black insect that produces this white wool and grows it over the course of its lifespan to protect it from cold and from desiccation and possibly from predation. Um, there they are. This is what they look like if you take all the wool off. Um, a lovely 
lovely insect. Um, this crazy curly Q child straw looking thing um, are the mouth is the mouth part assembly of this insect. Um, it's a stylet that goes down into the twig and then it, um, it, it takes out the starch that the tree has stored for its own use. That is not what kills the tree. What kills the, our trees, we're pretty sure, is that when, the, when these insects insert their stylets, it creates a wound. And our hemlocks very quickly wall off that wound to prevent any further um, infection or damage, which is great, except when you have this level of infestation. And when you have all of these individual wounds on a branch, then once the tree has walled off all of the, those wounds, it can't get its sap out to the end of the twigs to make next year's foliage. And what kills the tree is that it can't make any new needles and the trees eventually starve. Um, mortality usually happens in four to 20 years. Um, four years is more common in the South and the Southern Appalachians. Um, 20, sometimes even 20 plus, is what we've seen in the very coldest parts of our state so far. And this is where um, the climate change story comes in, because the reason that we have slower mortality is that these pests are pretty cold resistance, but once you get down to negative 5C, you start to see significant mortality. Uh, negative 10, negative 15, then you're seeing 90, 95% mortality, which is great. It gives you a little bit of breathing room. They have two generations a year, so they have two chances to bounce back before the next cold snap. But it gives our, our, a really, really cold winter, it gives our trees a chance to start to recover before the populations build up again. There are two things that are causing that to not help us as much anymore. One of them is that the pest is adapting to, to cold. And so the populations from the northern part of the infestation are surviving colder temperatures than the ones from the southern region. The other one is that those winter evenings are less cold. And so we're seeing fewer of those very, very cold nights, just like Lindsay was saying. And so we're not getting those big mortality events. For instance, um, just in the last five or six years, right or in the, the mid-teens, we had that polar vortex two or three years of really cold winters. Um, and that was great. We kept seeing 90 plus percent mortality at all of our study sites where we study overwintering mortality. Um, we have not seen that for the last three winters. And this winter, our maximum mortality at the northernmost point infestation point in New York was under 35%. So we are seeing booming populations this year and we're, we're finding a lot of new infestations. And the trees are likely to die more quickly, right? Because they're not getting that break. And so we're probably going to see our mortalities as we have fewer and fewer very cold nights, our mortality window narrowing. And that gives us less time to find a cure or identify the infestation and treat it. Um, before our trees die. I'm going to talk a little bit about phenology and spread, um, but I'm not going to linger on it. So here are the two generations. The overwintering generation is being laid just about now, and then they're going to emerge in late, late May, early June, and they're going to find a new place and stick those stylets in, and then they're, those Insects are actually going to enter um, a hibernation-like state uh, called excavation over the summer. And they're just gonna sit there and not do anything until they wake up in the fall and start developing. And then they'll develop, become adults in the late winter and start laying the spring generation. The spring generation has, not, has no estivation phase. It just settles and starts growing right away. And so they're late in the late winter and they're already laying the next generation's eggs now in the late spring. The first stage is called a crawler. This is the only life stage that can actually move. So this is the point where they go find a new home, stick their silent into a tree, and that's the last time they can do that. If you dislodge them, 
they will die because they can't put their stylet back in again. Um, again, they estimate over the summer that over that generation that's active now. And they look like this. And you can see how, um, how magnified this is. They are tiny. They look like teeny tiny little poppy seeds with a white halo like that. They're pretty hard to find in the summer. And so if you have a, a new infestation, you're less likely to be successful at finding it in the summertime, even though it's a great time to be in the woods. Um, winter is maybe a better time because they're actively growing and they have fresh new wool that's easier to find. Um, but a well-established infestation you can find anytime because um, you can see here, this is last year's wool. It's still hanging around, you can find it. So then they wake up and they start feeding and growing and making this wool again to protect themselves. And then they lay eggs, 50 to 100 eggs per individual. They're all female here. Um, so it's all asexual reproduction. So here's the three generations, the winter, the estivating systems wake up, they grow, they, they lay eggs and the daughters settle in amongst their mothers on the same twigs because the new foliage hasn't come out yet. And then the overwintering generation, so you've got both generations active there, and then the overwintering generation comes up just as the hemlocks are putting out that beautiful lime green new foliage, and that's where the overwintering generation settles. So why, why is this such a problem? We have an asexually reproducing insect, so they one, one individual can start a new infestation, two generations a year, so two opportunities for exponential growth, and we have no predators that specialize in HWA here. There's not a lot of things eating them out here. So we have to have no population control, and that's what's killing our trees, is that we just can't keep the HWA populations down. At this time, um, there's really one op option for management, which is chemical management. And all across the Eastern seaboard, people are working really hard on a biological control solution. For um, chemical management, there are really two options for anything bigger than a hemlock hedge. Um, anything bigger than a hedge, you can use imidacloprid, which is a slow acting chemical that can last three to seven years. Um, and you can also add dinotefuran, which works right away, but gives, gives up in a year. Um, Imidacloprid is widely available. It's available for homeowner use in the soil drench um, application. Dinotefuran is application only, uh, professional applicator only. We like the basal bark application best. We think it's the best management practice for this um, and that's where somebody comes out with a tank with a backpack sprayer of either midacloprid or both chemicals and put, sprays it on the first six feet of the tree. It soaks into the tree and moves, moves up into the canopy and kills the pest. Imidacloprid is a neonicotinoid, and I'm sure that you guys have heard about neonicotinoids lately, um, particularly with regards to pollinators and how they they problem for pollinators. Um, uh, Imidacloprid and neonicotinoids are the most widely used um, insecticides in the world. And it's because they are not damaging to mammals. And so we like to use them because they, what the, the chemicals that they replaced were very toxic to, to us. Um, so they don't have a lot of off-target impacts outside of the insect world. And the reason we think it's a good idea to use them here in this context is that hemlocks are wind pollinated. So the hemlock pollen is not of interest really to our pollinators and that makes it a pretty low risk app application for, for these chemicals. You also only have to apply them every few years, which is nice. Um, and deciding whether or not to treat, people often feel like, I don't want to use this chemical because there are potential off-target impacts. 
without considering the impacts of no treatment. If you do not treat your hemlocks, once you have an infestation, you are going to lose those hemlocks um, because there's really no other option right now. And the hemlock loss also triggers this cascade of ecological effects because they're a foundation species. You're essentially taking away that foundation from the ecosystem that depends on hemlocks. And so we would argue that um, treating your trees and keeping them alive is a lower impact option than just letting them go. And there's actually evidence for this. There was some research done on imidacloprid from a soil injection method where the, the imidacloprid goes into the ground and the researcher tracked its spread in the streams and she looked at the streams one year later and five years later. One year later, she did find some small impacts on the invertebrates in the streams, but five years later, the untreated streams, the streams near the untreated trees were in worse shape than the treated trees because the hemlocks were gone. So you just have to, to think about what the no action risks are when you're doing your risk um, risk reward equation. The other option is biological control. And this is, I work for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. We spend most of our time working on biological. Um, it's a long-term solution that functions at a landscape scale, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Um, all across the Eastern Seaboard, people are still doing the research and trying to figure out what works in the different ecosystems. Um, Laracobes beetles have been used for a long time. They're from the Pacific Northwest. They're one of the main predators that controls HWA very effectively out there. We've released about 17,000 as of last year, and they've been established at six, maybe seven sites in New York. Um, we're even more excited about the Leucothus silverflies, which we've only worked on with for about five years. They're also from the Pacific Northwest, but they feed on that spring generation that doesn't get knocked back in the winter. They eat the eggs of both generations. We released about 16,000 and we are actively searching for establishment. So these are our release sites so far. I'm sorry there are none in your region, but the good news is that it's because there's no HWA in your region yet. Hooray! Um, so the, the ideal time to think about management planning is now before this pest arrives so that when you first find it in your region, um, you have a plan that you can implement right away. And one of the big questions is if you have a decent sized property or you're managing a you know, county across several properties, you have a lot of hemlocks to deal with and you are not gonna be able to treat them all. So which ones do you save and which ones do you plan to mitigate the um, adapt to the change that's going to happen as, they, as they're as they lost. Um, we've actually developed a tool for this. Um, we worked with several partners around the state to do this, and we're really grateful for everybody's input and help getting this done, uh, including DEC and New York State Parks. Um, and there are two pieces of this, a Word document and an Excel file. And you can just look at the Word document and it will walk you through the mental process of which trees, what are the factors that you should consider when you're picking which, which hemlock stands to save and which ones to let go? And then if you really want to get quantitative, um, you can open the Excel file and score your various stands or your properties for each of the different traits, and it'll give you a number. And that's really useful if you're submitting a grant or you're trying to defend your decision to a, you know, a, a governing body of some kind. We would say if you're on the leading ed of, edge of an infestation, like you guys would be early in the infestation, you should absolutely treat because you're helping everyone around you as well as yourselves. If you have an old growth remnant, you should absolutely treat. If your trees are gonna be taken out in the next 10 years, don't treat unless you're at the leading edge. And everything else, just put it through the metric and see what you get. Stand traits um, are important to consider. The ecosystem services that are provided by the different stands, cultural traits, 
Hazard trees are really important, especially for properties with public access. Um, cultural resources, air, high use areas. And then it's important to consider about the, the sustainability of your management. Um, is, 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 the, is the landowner on board? Can you even treat there? Um, is there a lot of deer pressure? More, more deer pressure is probably actually more of an impetus to treat than not. And then um, if you, we need as many eyes on the ground, especially in your area as, as we can find. Um, there was the most recent find in Lake George was actually by a guy from Brooklyn who was camping with his family and said, hey, I think there's HWA in my campsite. I have that on my property at home. I didn't think it was in the Adirondacks. And he reported it to IMAP Invasives, and that's how the state found out about it. It turns out it's 250 acres of infestation. Pretty light, but huge, and he was the first one to find it. So all eyes on the ground are really critical. That's that new infestation. Um, this, is, this is the most recent map of infestation in New York. In the Sierra area, um, the tan areas are protected lands. The green is um, where we know there are hemlocks. Those are state lands. That's probably not that there are no hemlock here. It's just that I don't have a layer that shows them. So I don't know what's happening in these areas. And then these little blue lines, that's the only place we have any data at all for HWA in the Black River watershed. So if you're a landowner, please get out, survey your trees, um, treat if you find it, but in your region, absolutely report it to the EC, to IMAP invasives. And anybody can go out and look for hemlock trees and survey and report to IMAP invasives. The Slilo Prism, this map is actually from Slilo Prism. They have a very active HWA survey project that's going on right now. So if you go to their website, which either I or somebody else can put in the chat. Um, you can go here and, and you can see exactly where these, these spots that they particularly want help surveying are and help. So the, the connection to climate change with this pest is that it's going to be moving more quickly and it's going to be killing trees more quickly with increasing climate change. So, while 15 years ago, people were saying, oh, HWA is never going to be a problem in the in yeah. northern New York. That's not true. It's already in northern New York and it's moving. So it's, it really is a problem and uh, it's just going to continue to be a problem. You can't rely on those, those winter temperatures. Please survey, please treat. And, uh, and we're doing our very best to get biocontrols um, developed and out on the ground. That is our talk. Thank you. I know we're just past four o'clock, but I have a question um, for you if you have a minute. Um, I understand if folks have to uh, scoot out of here, but I do have a question. Does the fact that New York has so many uh, hemlocks work for us or against us in the infestation? Does it provide a buffer or does it just make them hungrier and have them spread more? Um, I think it probably works in our favor in that there are more trees to save um, and they, they, it can only move so fast, especially up here right now. Um, but the downside is that especially in the Tug Hill region, there's so many hemlocks that if we don't manage it effectively, it's going to be a real blow to the forest. Right. And I believe it's identified in the Black River Watershed Management Plan as one of those species, like you're saying, uh, it only grows in certain areas. So uh, the shady areas, the gorges and the, um, the, uh, the gulfs, as we call them. So they provide important habitat for species that are very unique to the area. So we, we're very concerned. So thank you. Um, Emily, thank, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Emily Sheridan is the Eastern Great Lakes Coordinator with yeah, DC. Um, <laughs> she has a chat in there saying that um, HWA monitoring is promoted in the winter, more so in the spring, because we don't want people, <coughs> excuse me, spreading spreading the, um, the, the pests. So yep, we actually way. suggested that at this point, if you're if you're going to be surveying, don't do more than one stand a day because we don't want you spreading it. 
Awesome. Thank you. If there are no more questions or comments, I would like to thank you uh, very much for taking the time to prepare to be here. This was a huge undertaking and I, we, Michelle and I uh, and the Watershed Partners really appreciate uh, all the hard work and, and your research. If you ever need um, a place to come do more research in the Black River Watershed, let us know. Um, we'd be happy to Absolutely. Uh, find some work for you. <laughs> be a part of that. So thank you so much. Yeah, lots of uh, kudos in the in the present in the in the chat. So thanks very much. Thank you for having us. I have to put on a a, a plug for the next uh, watershed web watershed webinar Wednesdays. Watershed Wednesday webinar. Who who came up with this, Michelle? Uh, next watershed Wednesdays. Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah, next Wednesday I believe we have um, is it Tim Hunt? Uh, hold on, I want to make sure I have the right. Uh, I believe so. That's yeah. that's the one I just got a, a reminder for. <laughs> that's right. So it's snow and ice best practices, and that relates to road salt. So we hope you'll join us for that. Um, check out tughill.org, and we have information on our website on where to go for the next uh, presentations. All right. And if that's Thank it, you again, everyone. Thanks very much. Very nice presentations. Very Thank good you. presentations. <laughs>